So who or, or what is a superhero? Well, I'm a college president, and I have to admit that I don't have a whole lot of time to read comic books. But there's something I've noticed about superheroes. Aside from the fact that they apparently all wear really tight uniforms <laughs> and have some kind of logo on their chest, they almost always start out as normal people who discover powers in the face of some challenge. So let me give you a few examples that you'll be familiar with. So young Bruce Wayne saw his parents murdered before his eyes, and he dedicated himself to fighting crime as Batman. Superhero, Superman's parents sent him away from Krypton, uh, their home planet, before it exploded and killed them. I guess being orphaned is another common theme. And when he landed on Earth, he discovered that the yellow rays of the sun gave him superpowers. Wonder Woman traveled from a remote Amazon island to help a downed fighter pilot to return to man's world. And when she got there, she discovered that she could use her superpowers to fight Nazis. Now, of course, the idea of discovering your hidden and, and powerful self did not originate with comic books. If you read Greek myths or Shakespeare or the Bible or Moby Dick or the Harry Potter series, in fact, if you read stories from almost any culture in any picture in any period of time in human history, uh, you'll see that we've always had a love for reading about people who discover something in themselves greater than they had thought they had. And each of us wants to be more than just plain old Clark Kent. Now, in the real world, we will probably never fly or project power rays or transform ourselves into human torches. Um, but, but there are other powers in each of us that make us capable of great heroism. At Grinnell College, where I work, I get to meet a lot of really successful and influential alumni and other people who are committed to important causes. And I try really hard to understand how they got where they arrived. I, I talk to our professors and students about their own experiences, and I read a lot of books, a lot of books. Not many comic books, a lot of other books. And finally, I'm also a doctor. For much of my career, I, I was a physician. And so I think altogether I've had a pretty good insight into how people harness their inner powers for the good of others. Now, through all this experience, I've, I've learned to believe in two types of heroes what I call front-of-the-room heroes and back-of-the-room heroes. And I'll tell you about people that I think fit into these two categories. And uh, Brandy Agerbach, who is one of our Grinnell graduates, um, is going to use her, her artistic talents to, to illustrate what I'm saying as I speak. Now, one of the things I want to emphasize to you is that real-world heroes might seem superhuman, um, but in reality, they're really ordinary people like you and me. Um, they go about their lives, and then at some point, they're challenged. They find themselves in a challenging situation, and maybe a war or a natural disaster or a personal uh, challenge of some sort, um, and, and sometimes it's someplace less dramatic, like a classroom or a polling station. And they see that people need help, and they're driven to provide that help. Um, the passion can turn any one of us from ordinary Clark Kent's into Superman or Superwoman. Um, um, so I'll give you a couple of examples. So let me start with a man named James Kofi Annan. Um, he's what I call a front of the room hero. Um, I don't know if you realize this, but slavery still exists in the world today, even in parts of Africa, uh, in this example, in Ghana. James' parents, who were desperately poor, sold him into child slavery when he was six years old. And for the next seven years, from the time he was six until he was 13, he was tortured, beaten, starved, uh, almost drowned, and worked up to 17 hours a day. Finally, after seven years of just incredible suffering, he escaped. And I find it hard to imagine even what it took within him to escape. Um, picture this, you're 13 years old, your parents sold you into slavery, you've been tortured and beaten and worked half to death, you can't read or write. You're trapped in a remote area of Africa with no family, uh, no friends, no community. And you have nowhere to go and no money. Um, would you have the courage to run away? And where would you run to? Well, James persevered remarkably. 
he escaped, and he eventually borrowed school books from kindergartners to teach himself how to read and write. He worked full time at every job he could possibly get, and he used the money to put himself through school, and not just elementary school. He ultimately went to college and graduate school and became a very successful bank manager in Ghana. Um, but then he, he, he realized that even though he had a very comfortable salary and had achieved all the things that he thought were important, that, that money and comfort was not enough. He wanted to help others, and he particularly wanted to help kids who were in the situation that he had been in. So he organized an organization called Challenging Heights, whose mission is to educate and support children, children who are in slavery in Africa, in Ghana in particular. And with help, these children have a chance to overcome truly incredible hardships and become healthy and productive individuals. Now, James did these things because he found that he had a gift. He had passion and courage, and these qualities enabled him to escape slavery and to transform himself into a highly educated and successful person with the power to help others. Now, I met James when he came to Grinnell College to receive an award that the college gave him. And in his acceptance speech, he said that his gift was his vitality, his energy. Um, and that was the reason for his existence and for his success. So, so James is what I, what I call a front of the room hero. Um, Martin Luther King was a front of the room hero. Um, in the face of truly monumental uh, uh, challenges and, and extraordinary evil, these front of the room heroes um, managed to sort of jump into the telephone booth of life um, and unveil their powers of leadership and organization and the ability to inspire others to help address society's ills. They make public speeches, they organize events, uh, they travel around the world rallying support for their causes. Now there's a second type of hero that, that I call the back of the room hero. Um, these folks don't wear superhero costumes or lead the charge against, against injustice in the way that James or Martin Luther King did. Um, they often toil for years without thanks or even acknowledgement of any type. But their work makes a huge difference, as large a difference as the work of the front of the room heroes. And I'll give you what is probably my favorite example, a woman named Septa McClark. Now, she was a teacher in South Carolina from the 19-teens to the 1960s. She was a remarkable woman. She was an African-American woman. Um, her, she, her father had been born into slavery, and she managed to go to college and become a teacher. But when she began teaching, it was actually against the law to be hired as an African-American woman teacher in the city of Charleston, South Carolina. So she went to teach in remote rural areas of the state. She would teach children during the day and illiterate adults in the community at night, and she would often use even sort of commonplace household materials like the Sears catalog to educate the adult students in how to read and write. Um, and this was a time, and it wasn't that far in the past, when, when African Americans were still routinely denied basic civil rights, and particularly the right to vote. Now, the civil rights activists of the time organized huge voter registration drives throughout the South. And in many places, uh, black Americans could show, show up at the polls to register, but they were forced to take a literacy test. And if you couldn't read, then you couldn't register to vote. Now, um, the racist lawmakers who made up these, these laws did it intentionally. They knew that most African Americans in the South weren't well-educated and were largely illiterate, and, and that they wouldn't be able to literally sort of pass these very simple tests and fill out forms to register to vote. So Satya McClark, who was sort of just a teacher and not any kind of sort of front room superhero, saw injustice and decided that one way to overcome this was to teach people how to read and write. She saw that no matter how successful the sort of front of the room uh, leaders were in inspiring people to vote, that, that they still needed to pass these tests and they needed to be able to fill out the forms. She, she realized that unless you could teach people to fill out the forms, it didn't matter how inspired they were. And so she was a part of a group of people and the leader who set up this extraordinary system of citizenship schools throughout the South. And these were remarkable schools where she and largely other African-American women teachers throughout the Deep South taught people how to read and write, largely adults. Um, and this, was, uh, this may seem like a, a small thing. It was a revolutionary thing. Um, Rosa Parks, many of you may know her name, 
uh, took place, uh, took part in some of these uh, citizenship schools. Um, and now, Septima was not famous. Uh, most people have actually never heard of her. There are no big movies by Oprah Winfrey uh, about her. Um, she's not a star. There are no songs about her. Um, there have now been, I think, two small books written about her. Um, but when Martin Luther King went to receive the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964, do you know what he did? He insisted that she accompany him to Sweden to receive this award because he realized that she had played this pivotal role, this unheralded role um, in advancing the right of civil rights in the South, the, the movement in civil rights in the South. And, and he insisted that she accompany him. And he did this because she had had such a big role to play. Now, now she was not a superhero by any measure. Um, so on the one hand, you have people like James, who was a front of the room hero, who created a powerful organization. He makes wonderful speeches. He travels all over the world. We, he's coming back to teach a short course at Grinnell. Um, and then on the other hand, you have people like Septa McClark, um, who worked in the back of the room. She was toiling day in and day out doing the sort of grunt work of running citizenship schools, often with little money, um, and often with, uh, at, at great risk to herself physically. Um, now, they both faced violence and repression and ridicule and doubt and fear, and they had to both overcome poverty and prejudice. Um, but in the face of these challenges, James and Septima discovered their personal superpowers and used them to help others. When James spoke at Grinnell last year, he said that it was important for each of us to identify our own mission, um, our own calling. And once we've identified our calling, we'll find that we are not doing the same things that other people are doing, but we will be doing the things that we each are called to do. Um, I've encountered superheroes throughout my life, seemingly ordinary people, from humble backgrounds who do extraordinary things because they see injustice or suffering, and instead of turning away, they dig deep within themselves and decide to do something about it. I'm looking out at this room today, and I, I don't see a single cape fluttering in the wind out there. You know, I don't see any superhero uniforms. I don't see super elastic arms stretching out to save people falling off of buildings. Um, so how do you become a, a superhero? Well, you have at least uh, one choice. Um, you can become a front of the room hero and advocate for people in need. Um, you can create and run organizations and marches and plan big benefit concerts and use your passion and conviction to rally others in support of your cause. Now, you won't get much sleep or have many vacation days, but like James, you'll find that you can focus people's attention on the causes that you care about, and that can be a very potent thing to do. Or you can work from the back of the room, like Septima Clark. This means you will have to be constantly on the lookout for suffering and injustice, and specifically look for stumbling blocks that may not be visible even from the front of the room. Um, then you roll up your sleeves and you get to work to address a problem. Um, that can be hard and thankless. It can be frustrating. It can often be incredibly boring. Um, you might wonder if you have chosen the right path, um, or if you might be having more fun playing with your friends. Um, the reality is that no one is ever going to draw a Marvel comic book about a super teacher who works 14 hours a day teaching poor kids to read and to write. But we desperately need back-of-the-room superheroes as much as we need front-of-the-room heroes. And my goal isn't to persuade you in favor of one kind or the other. What I do want to do, though, is to ask you to look inside yourselves and to think about what your own superpowers might be. Envision a future where you are the hero and you ask yourself what kind of powers you need to transform that future and to make it happen. As a college president, I'm here to remind you that education, real education, is probably the best way that you can do this. Real education is not about memorizing facts. It's about understanding who you are. It's about discovering your powers, about your passions, wherever they may be, Whatever skill you have, I guarantee you that you can find a way to use it to help people, so you need to do it. When I asked my question at the beginning of this talk about what is a, a superhero, who is a superhero, you probably thought of someone else other than yourself. And, and for now, maybe that's true. Um, but if James, 
Kofi Annan can start at age 13 in one of the poorest towns on the world's poorest continent, and if Satya McClark can hold reading classes in the back of rickety country stores to avoid the wrath of the KKK, if people like James and Satya can give all of their sweat and tears and love and sometimes even their lives to make the world a better place, well, then there's only one choice for you. And, and the real choice is you, you, you can't afford not to become a superhero. Um, the world desperately needs as many people as possible, uh, making it a better place. And whether you feel more comfortable in the front of the room or the back of the room, you need to be in the room. Um, and I encourage all of you to, to look within yourselves to try to find out what makes you passionate and to devote yourselves to helping us make the world a better place. We need every single one of you to contribute. Thank you very much.